The place that I am most comfortable is holding these and in a kitchen. This is my knife roll and uh, in it I have the tools that I, I use most. I have my utility knife. Uh, my mom got this for me. And then I got, have my par paring knife. Uh, and then uh, my chef's knife. You know how if you bring a craftsman in, a craftsman, a screwdriver, and you've broken it because you use it like a chisel, they look at you and they say, it looks like you use it like a chisel, and you say, yes, could I have a new screwdriver, please? They do the same thing with knives, hinkles. This knife, I can use the heck out of it. And if I ever manage to break it, hey, can I get a new one? I love this knife. And uh, so this is, these are, using these, I am at my most comfortable, not just in my kitchen, but in your kitchen. I will gladly come over and cook for you. That's not like some idle thing. Like I, it would be fun to come on over and take a swing. Let me know, we'll schedule it. That, uh, <laughs> But I take great joy in cooking. It's where I am confident. It is where I'm relaxed. It's where I'm just enjoying myself, right? Where do you have that sense of confidence and relaxation? You know what you're up to. You're, to think about that, right? Think about that feeling. You know what you're doing. You got this, right? If someone asks, you just you got it under control. Right? It, it, maybe it's not cooking for you. Maybe it, it's something else completely. But uh, what was the, Remember that sense, right? That feeling of confidence and ease and you know what you're doing. You're in your element. We read today of Peter. Peter standing up with the eleven and, and giving what you can call the first sermon. It's what happens right after the church is born as the spirit moves and people go out into the street. And uh, I want to ask, as Peter is standing in front of the eleven, preaching to this group of people, what do you think his tone is? Right? You, you know what it's like to watch someone who's speaking in front of people who's really nervous and scared and they kind of curl up on themselves and they're... they're and uh, they start rushing because they're, they're worried. And, and do you think that's what Peter sounded like? No. I mean, what, what do you think? What, what's the tone? Like, as I read this, what I, what I, what the tone that I hear in my voice is of, of confidence. Because right? he starts out by telling a joke, right? Y'all know we're not drunk. It's, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. Let, let me tell you what's happening here, right? I, I hear a, a certain confidence there. It's, uh, as he declares, uh, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let it be known that uh, in the last days, as the prophet Joel declares, that my sp spirit will be poured out upon you. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The people you least expect to hear are going to have a word for you. Right, that's how he starts this out. He starts out with a bit of jesting, and then he goes in and he starts talking confidently. Confidently because, well, it's a lot easier to be confident when you have 11 good friends right beside you. That definitely helps. He's confident uh, that people are going to hear and respond. He's confident in what he has to say. Right, if you believe what you're doing, it's pretty easy to be confident in it, right? He is confident in, in the message he has to bring that he has something really, really good to offer. But let me tell you about Jesus. He has forgiven me, and this is good news for you. So he starts telling them this. He says, uh, at one point in verse 22, he says, uh, You Israelites, listen to what I have to say. He is specifically speaking to Israelites at this point. He hasn't had his uh, experience uh, of having to eat what's put in front of him. Um, so he, he's, still he's still focusing on Israelites. He's not quite focusing on... Uh, Acts is the book that it, it looks at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the entire world. Uh, we're not there yet. We're still at the beginning. But he's telling telling them that this is in line with the prophets. And then he's telling them that this Jesus I'm telling you about, he is David's heir, the one we've been waiting for. And when this city rejected and crucified him, death could not keep him. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this Spirit so that you both can see and hear what's happening right here. 
And so people heard and they listened and they responded and people asked, what should we do? And they, they repent, which is to, means to turn. They, they turn towards Jesus and they accept the gift of a baptism and they join this way of uh, following uh, Jesus. And it's an amazing thing to think about, too, in that, can you, what would you do if that many people joined the church all at once? Like, how many services would you have to add on a Sunday? I mean, this is an amazing moment. But this all begins with Peter standing up there and proclaiming confidently. As we talked about Acts last time, as we went over the whole book, one of the key things to know about the book of Acts is that it's the sequel, right? It begins with the Gospel of Luke, and that's the Gospel of Luke is written. It tells you why it's written. At the beginning verses of Luke, it says, This is written, my dear Theophilus, my dear person who loves God, so that you might know about Jesus' doings and sayings, so that you might come to faith. And so it's assumed that if you are reading Acts, you've read Luke, and you have come to faith, and now you read Acts, and it's the story of what happens next. And in a sense, it is a bit of a script. Like, it's a bit of a script of, for if you're going to follow Jesus, here is what the first followers of Jesus did. Go and do the same. And so, as the person who's reading this, for the first time reads it, gets to reading about how Peter preaches, well... Does that mean that I'm supposed to preach as well? Eh, I don't think everyone here should start writing sermons for Sunday. Uh, if anyone ever wants to preach a sermon, let me know. We can arrange that. But uh, I don't think like everyone needs to start preaching right now. But to be willing to have a few words to say in the moments and in the context in which you live, yes. Like, the moment in which Peter was speaking this, Peter was in Jerusalem, a town of, uh, of 600,000 people, and in the middle of a religious festival where all the faithful Jews had come to town. And so he is preaching, <coughs> saying these few words to people, just a bunch of Jewish people who are there, who have uh, the same faith that he does, who are willing to listen. And of those 600,000 people in the town, 3,000 then repent and are baptized. There aren't 3,000 people in Shelbina to talk to if you've got them all in the same room. So you're not going to have that same calling or opportunity. This script doesn't, you don't have to follow the script exactly, but the script of saying, you know, what we need to be able to be able to say something. Well, yes, we have opportunities in our lives to say something. Times when we can respond with good news to the situation that is in front of us. If someone is grieving, I'll tell you the single best thing to say. God weeps with you. And then shut up. Right? That, that's God weeps with you and then go make him a casserole. That's it. Right? That is the gospel for when someone is grieving. If, if there's a moment of joy, you name it. This is a gift. God-given gift. Look at that sunrise. Isn't that a beautiful gift, right? If someone is bored, you can, what are you doing this weekend? I got nothing going on. Well, do we have anything going on? Right? We have something going on, don't we? At any point this week, someone's bored, you tell them. We got a soup supper coming up, and it's going to be tasty. Let me tell you about, we got the potato soup, and it's going to be so good. You got something to tell them. To be confident and to be, say something about what we have to offer here, right? it will probably not be the case that, like Peter, we're going to go out on the street corner and start talking about the prophet Joel in Jewish, the Jewish Messiah, because that's not our context. Right? If you remember, Peter is speaking in Jerusalem, and he is a Jew among Jews in a, in a, in a time when everyone was a practicing Jew. And every, when he says the prophet Joel, everyone would go, oh yeah, the prophet Joel, I learned about that when I was five. Like, that's not the time we live in. And, and so you, want, you don't start telling people about the pro prophet Joel. What you do is you tell them, you got some good news here. That you keep it short, keep it simple, right? We live in a, in a place that does not have that shared religious background, but we do live in a place of an openness to religion that is, might be surprising to you. Um, I was looking at some demographics for a presentation I made this weekend, uh, yesterday, and in Northeast Missouri, 70% of people surveyed uh, say that they believe in a God that loves them. In any community, 20% of people are actively in worship on a Sunday. What's, what do those numbers tell you? 50% right? of people that you meet out there, give or take, believe God loves them and aren't actively involved in church somewhere. 
So if someone says, I'm bored this weekend, odds are if you say, I've got something going on at my church, they're going to listen. They're going to respond. They will accept it, and it will be a, a gift to them, right? We have uh, good news to sh share, and there's a lot of people who are willing to hear it. The question is, do we say it with confidence? I mean, that ends up being the first thing. Do we have the confidence to say it and say it well, right? Because if you're not confident in what you offer, it shows. And, and I think we have a, a challenge of confidence at times. When it comes to having the confidence to speak up, it's essential. Um, Acts, which tells us the story of how the church begins and grows, there are 28 times where it stops to, t to talk about how someone got up and said something. Right? It is a, an obvious part of the early church, getting up and saying something. 28 times it points out when this happens. But there is always a risk when you get up and say something because you might be uncomfortable. Anyone here really enjoy being uncomfortable? Right? Nope. Right? No one enjoys being uncomfortable. It takes a bit of a risk. I mean, you might hard to know what people are going to respond, how people are going to respond. But to be confident in what you're going to say and to be confident that it is worth saying. Uh, yesterday, I got up in front of a group to, to lead a, a two-hour committee meeting, first meeting of this group. Um, and I, me and my friend John, who are running this group, are the youngest people in the room by a few decades. And, uh, and so I'm looking at my boss, and then next to him is the guy who last time I saw him handed me my diploma. Right? That's a little bit intimidating. Oh, hello, Dr. Jack Magruder, president of Truman. Eek. My name's Andy. You don't remember? And I told him last time I shook your hand. Last time I saw you, you were handing me a diploma. And uh, it was to get up in front of people like that, it's uncomfortable. Right? It, it, it's not exactly what I, I would love to do all the time. However, I did it because I'm confident in what I'm about to say, and, and it was worth it. The goal of this group is to. Um, how does the district help every rural church go from any sickness they grapple with to being healthier and thriving? And so this is something I believe in profoundly, and I believe it's worth doing. And so I got over being uncomfortable, and I did it. And that's what we see in Peter. I mean, do you think he was at least somewhat uncomfortable getting up in front of thousands of people? Yes. But it was worth it. And he did it. What you have to say to people you meet this week is worth saying. It truly is. The things that we say, the good news we have, is important. If, you, if someone needs someone, you can tell them, there's a family here waiting for you. If someone feels lost, you can tell them, I've got a place you can be found. You can tell people, you know, I know you're beating yourself up over this, but you can come and hear the good news of forgiveness every week right here. As we practice saying these words, as we risk being uncomfortable, as we, we, it builds confidence, right? But uh, confidence grows as you practice. The first time that, that I started playing with knives, I mean, I was not quite as uh, confident as I am today. And if I had seen my 12-year-old Andy playing with knives, like I, 30, 38 this week, I guess, 38-year-old Andy playing with knives, I would have slapped that younger Andy's hands. But now... Yeah. Confidence. It grows. You just got to do it, right? Think about the thing you're most confident in doing, that sense of ease. Did you start out that confident? <coughs> nope, right? To be willing to be uncomfortable, to trust that you will become confident, it takes some practice. And just knowing that it's worth saying is where we begin. Just to have something to offer, to have confidence that what we have to offer here is good. Do you believe that what we have to offer here is good? Right? Is it this a wonderful thing? You get together today, and you're going to be able to talk. You're going to go have a wonderful meal. Isn't this great? Is there anywhere else you would rather be right now than here with these people about to have this great meal? I, I, I'm happy here. This is good. Right? And if you... Th another bit of demographic data for you. Of those people surveyed in Northeast Missouri, you know what their main preference is for worship? 70% prefer traditional. This, it's not a matter of ripping this out and throwing in a praise band. It's a matter of turning up the organ and singing what we already sing and doing it well. It's what people around here like anyways. Let's do it well and have some confidence that what we have here is wonderful. 
is our God-given gift that we can share it with others. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7, God does not want us to be shy with his gifts, but be bold and loving. God does not give us a spirit of timidity. God gives us a spirit of courage. I find those words to be fitting. Uh, the, the beginning of the church is Peter stepping up and being bold and having some confidence. And I invite you to do the same. I invite you to, to believe in what we have here and to be willing to say throughout the week, I have something good, a good place to go, a place you can hear about forgiveness, a place that you can be accepted and welcome. Be bold and loving, trusting that what we have to offer here is good news. For the grieving, we offer the hope of Jesus Christ. For the lonely, we offer the fellowship of a family that accepts all. For the floundering, we offer the purpose of doing the work of God's kingdom. And for all people, we offer the good news of forgiveness and of reconciliation with Christ. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? Thanks be to God. Amen.